Thank you to all my patrons for supporting the channel. Nam, Nam, come quick! What's wrong? I need to make a review on Persona 1, but apparently that game doesn't exist. <laughs> oh no. Well, I'm sure things will work out tomorrow. Why don't you sleep on it, eh? No, no, I should probably just get something to eat. You in the mood for toast? <laughs> Whoa, wacky. I get that reference. How about some pancakes? <laughs> That's so witty of you. I never even saw it coming. Alright, I'm just gonna review the game now. Yeah, you do that. Ozzy. Ah, Persona, Persona, Persona. PERSONA! Once a relatively unknown series in the West, it's since grown to become a gaming phenomenon widely appreciated by everybody. In all seriousness, this is a series that, without exaggeration, has changed my life in a myriad of ways, and I can't help but find every title to be charming and enjoyable in their own ways. Bundling together unique RPG mechanics with heartfelt stories that blend mythos and pathos, consistently memorable casts with relatable passions and arcs, every single game manages to be uniquely unforgettable. For those who have stuck around with my channel from the start, it's apparent that when it comes to Persona 5 in particular, yeah, I never shut up. But it's about time I changed that, and there's no better place to start than this one. It's Persona 1. You saw the title of the video, you clicked on- Why am I explaining- Yes, Persona 1, otherwise known as Shin Megami Tensei Persona. Though in reality, it's actually labeled as Megami Ibanroku Persona, or Revelations Persona in the West- Oh my gosh, Atlas, just pick a brand! Released in 1996 on the PlayStation 1, and eventually getting a remake for the PSP in 2009, this title served to kick off a new sub-series within Megami Tensei, right alongside their Shin Megami Tensei and Majin Tensei series. This was actually the first RPG that Atlas released in the West, the team believing that this game had the right mix of appeals to finally break into the western market. Of course they couldn't help but try a bit too hard to appeal, <laughs> but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. While it's often joked about by newcomers and comedians that this game is non-existent, it is genuinely a clear contender for the most niche game in its own series. However, with the arrival of Persona's 25th anniversary, What? Atlas has started showing a bit more love for the cast across the series that usually don't get the spotlight, so there's no better time to delve into each of these games and show more people what makes them special. So with that said, welcome to my crusade to become the world's biggest show for this series. My mission statement for this year is to review every Persona game I can possibly get my hands on, from its origins to current day, and giving my personal, certified, official canon ranking of each title as I go. After all, I've always been curious as to how we got from here to here. So obviously that means starting right at square one and playing through Persona 1, so... You could actually play SMT if, which spearheaded a lot of the concepts- ah, Jeez, right, forgot you were still in my house. <clears throat> Well, if we're going to be playing P1, we've got Nam's compendium here to also share his thoughts and to potentially harass me. Nam? Hey everyone, when I heard Ozzy here was playing Persona 1, I just couldn't resist the urge to jump in and bully him over his opinions. Thanks for having me on, by the way. Nice to have you here, um, totally invited, so yikes, let's just get this over with while the cops are on their way. Just as a heads up, while I won't be combing over every plot detail and specifics, this will feature a spoiler overview of the plot, so if you want to go in totally blind, I'd shut this off and come back when you're ready. But if you don't mind hearing my thoughts on it all before taking the dive, I hope you enjoy the ride. Persona 1 isn't the most narratively dense game to begin with, so spoilers aren't going to kill your experience in my opinion, but you can never be too careful. And as a final note, I chose to play the PSP version of this game for the review instead of the PS1 version, though I will touch on the various differences between versions for all of you. I also chose to use the HD Texture mod created by Ryubu, and it's honestly pretty dang cool. While I own the game on Vita, I had to use emulation to actually record my footage. So on that note, while I don't necessarily mind the original visuals at all, the upscale is pretty snazzy. Not necessary, but it's cool. Now with all clarifications dealt with, where do I even begin? I mean, the start of the game would be nice. Don't sass me. 
Also make sure to subscribe if you like content like this since there's gonna be a lot more like it in the future. Once I dreamt I was a butterfly. I forgot myself and knew only my happiness as a butterfly. Soon I awoke and I was myself again. Did I dream that I was a butterfly or do I now dream that I am a man? Persona 1 opens with this quote from the philosopher Zhuangzi, and its thematic ties to the plot and themes from this point will never slow down. This game takes the butterfly concept to its core, and it's wholly present from the starting OP, which, whoo, whoo, this opening! Dream of Butterfly has such a perfectly fitting and intense quality to it. The visual aesthetic is blended together so well that it's honestly hard to tell until you've beaten the game that over half the visuals are solely taken from things you see in the game itself. It's really creatively handled, and the song on display is a clear favorite of mine, being sung by Yumi Kawamura, who is most famous for her contributions to Persona 3. Meanwhile, the original PS1 opening is... Very slow and kind of boring, I hate to say it, but it does give a drastically different tone that better fits aspects of this version's darker aesthetic. Plus, it's got a few bits of symbolism that aren't present in Dream of Butterfly that actually hint towards a lot of interesting things within the plot. Not my personal preference, but it has its appeal. Now, Persona 1 is a very different RPG from what the most modern series outings would suggest. Social links? Nope. A calendar system? Nada. A grand story with emphasis on equally grand presentation? Well, I guess grand things happen in this story? But otherwise, this game is pretty small scale and linear. And that fact rears its head as hitting start on the game immediately thrusts you into a room with a bunch of random kids. No real fanfare or anything, we're just diving right in. We're given some light interactions that introduce us to an assortment of the main cast. From Nanjo, Yukino, Ayase, some other idiot, I don't freaking care. And our designated bro character, Mark. Also, there's Naoya. There's me right there. The crew tempt fate by playing the Persona game, aka a babyish equivalent to Bloody Mary, except the ghost actually shows up. And oh gosh, man down, everyone run! The entire cast takes a whooping via a broken power outlet. But as they lay unconscious, a moment of peace finally descends as they're visited in their dreams by a friendly spirit who calls himself Philemon. Oh no, I hate this! Please switch to the PSP cutscenes! <sighs> Much, much better. He then asked me if I still remember how to spell my own name since I just got my brain boiled. Splendid. He discusses the basic concepts of personas and how they're the various selves within us. Apparently our soul is pretty cool, so he gives us this awesome crystal friend and we go off on our way from... whatever the heck this was. And you wake up in the hospital. It was all a dream. Seconds after waking from your literal sleep paralysis, you're then told to leave the doctor's office so you can run down the street to visit... the doctor. Maybe I really did get my brain fried. Leaving the school. How the frick do I get out of here? Oh, I can zoom around like a Looney Tunes character. That's neat. While it isn't really incentivized at all, we're able to explore the town at large once we escape the school. And there's a shocking amount of detail put in. It almost feels unnecessary, as in my first playthrough of the game, I literally saw none of this. But you get a lot of neat details and extra gear to prep you up for the adventure ahead. You can also enter the office of a company named Sebek, and um... Hey, I wonder who the bad guy is. I wonder. Anywho, Nanjo's butler shows up because his father never would, I relate, and they simply dismiss him as they go to the hospital to meet up with Maki. She's apparently a friend of the group, so the crew wants to cheer her up however possible. The plan didn't really pan out. As they stand defeated in the hall, they quietly wonder how they can cheer her up, but then... <laughs> An earthquake? Whoa, it's a big one! The hell? Hold on! It seems to have subsided. Maki! Whoa! What the hell? Where'd the room go? I sort of joked about it earlier, but seriously, the quality of the CG cutscenes in the PSP port is surprisingly great. It's always a treat to see them when they show up, so it's a worthwhile trade-off from that. Why is he, why is he just T-posing there? I don't understand what's going on. It doesn't... 
What? 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 I honestly wish we got more of them, but as it stands, they hit a sweet spot of sorts. Anywho, the door turns into a wall, your first dungeon is in a hospital, everyone gets their personas at once, and Nanjo's not father father bites the dust fighting some zombies. Now, this moment actually highlights one of my biggest issues with this game. Aside from a lack of build up to this moment, and the brevity of Yamaoka's death, um, that's this dude's name by the way, it's the presentation itself that manages to be the biggest factor in holding back this game's story, at least in most cases. The plot has some genuinely great moments throughout, which I'll be sure to touch on as we go, yet most of them fall a bit flat due to everyone being stuck with the exact same empty expressions the entire time. The game does feature moments where the writing manages to transcend what the stylistic limitations warrant, but if this game had proper sprite work like you know, the immediate next entry, I feel like it would be infinitely better as an experience. I appreciate this nice art being here in some form, like these are literally their official renders just slapped into the game. But I wonder if, in the case that they didn't have the resources to do multiple expressions, if it would have worked better with a simpler style or simply without the portraits. That was a long tangent about portrait art, so anyways, the old man dies. This moment still succeeds in establishing Nanjo and his character arc through the game, so I do appreciate it in that respect. Honestly, despite my whole spiel about this stuff just now, when the emotional beats actually land in this game, they hit hard. I'm gonna put a pause on going beat by beat down the whole plot, so while we're here, why not talk about the gameplay itself? Anyone familiar with traditional Megami Tensei experiences will be used to the style of first-person dungeon crawling, but if you're a more modern fan of this series, don't let this scare you off. The navigation is pretty simple and fluid, especially in the PSP version where your movement isn't, you know, a mile a century, and it better fits a lot of the exploration elements within this game. If you've played SMT Strange Journey, you know what you're getting into. And now we've got enemy encounters. There is a lot of combat in this game, notably more than there is cutscene dialogue, and that combat is… divisive. A lot of people find these battles incredibly boring and tedious, but to be honest, I thought they were pretty fun. It's definitely the most unique battle system in the entire series, where you have up to 5 party members arranged on a grid, and different abilities are assigned different attack ranges and shapes, almost playing out more like a strategy game than a traditional RPG at times. Persona Chess! I don't know if I'm actually going to use that. Not dissimilar to the Persona shtick we know and love today, you'll be using elements to hit weaknesses and smack the crap out of your opponents. You don't gain extra turns or anything based on these hits though, and simply get a boost in damage. More notable though is that, instead of the usual 10 or so elemental types, there are like 30. Some are variations of others that certain elements can be placed under, such as pistols, knives, and bows all being labeled under terms like gun, though some enemies will be either weak to just one or multiple types of gun weapons, or be weak to all or weak to some and block others. It's decently easy to navigate which terms mean what when you're looking through it all, but it's just too needlessly complex. And in most situations, you can probably just power through enemies regardless of weakness. One function that actually might surprise newer Persona fans though is that every party member can swap between up to three different personas you assign to them, meaning their tactics are most often determined by whatever you yourself decide. Though depending on their arcana, most personas will work better or worse with different people, it's a little weird. Oh, and in case this needs any explaining because you somehow clicked onto this video and have no cultural awareness about the anime high school game, personas are just representations of the true self within a person, and they can float out of you and shoot fire. Or axe. The variety in Persona options and team composition is pretty cool, but it does end up highlighting one of the stranger aspects of the gameplay loop. So, each party member has a regular level, each indicated by 5 stats, though only vitality and dexterity actually make a meaningful difference. But they also have a Persona level, not in reference to each Persona they use, though that's also a thing, but rather an indicator of what the highest level Persona they can equip is. This level then gets averaged out across the entire party to determine what demons you can then recruit to join you in negotiations. It's a weird system, and honestly wouldn't be too huge of an issue if leveling in this game wasn't handled so strange. Each character's experience is primarily determined by how much damage they can actively deal in battle. So if you have one or two party members that wipe the floor, the level gap between them and the others will gradually widen. Granted, in my experience it rarely caused any issues, mostly just in actually negotiating for new personas like previously stated, but it's still a bit of a baffling system in practice. So luckily it never came back in future titles. Though speaking of negotiations, Nam, take it away. 
Okay, let's just get this over with. Negotiation is a huge aspect of the Megami Tensei franchise, and it's as simple as it sounds. You talk to a demon and try to bargain with them until they become your ally. Persona 1 has a more unique take on this idea. Demons can feel multiple emotions depending on the actions your party members take. To keep things simple, your goal is to make a demon eager. By making a demon eager, you'll be able to get that demon's spell card. Think of it as a copy of the demon's essence. You can then use these spell cards to fuse brand new personas for your party members to use. It sounds very simple on paper, but this system is actually far more complex than you may first realize. Every demon has a personality type that's unique to them. This means that they'll respond differently to your party member's actions. Let's say you send out Mark to the front lines and have him danced crazy. While this will make one demon eager, this could potentially make another scared, happy, or even angry. The main challenge comes from discovering which actions is suited for the demon's specific personality type. At the start of the game, demons will only have one personality type, but eventually they'll gain up to four different personalities. So negotiation does, at the very least, stay fresh. But one of the major flaws with this system in my eyes is the fact that you have too many different contact options to choose from. Every party member has four different methods of contact, and since you have five party members for almost the entire game, you have a total of 20 different contact methods to choose from. Some demons are very specific when it comes to what makes them eager, so if you don't want to waste a lot of time experimenting, then it's in your best interest to look at the demon negotiation guide for this game. And that's not even considering the more technical aspects of this mechanic, such as the moon phases or how the average party level determines what demons you can negotiate with. It's all just too overwhelming for something that you're only going to be using once in a while. It's a very interesting idea, but I'm not too sure about you, Ozzy, but I find this system to be far more frustrating than engaging. I'll agree! It's definitely interesting, and at the very least is entertaining, but actually navigating through is a bit more of a gamble than it needs to be. Battles otherwise tend to be your standard affair. Do damage, buff and debuff, inflict ailments, it's your standard JRPG. Though on the note of ailments, whoever decided to program fights to allow endless charm loops where I'm unable to attack for all eternity as I stare at my party beating each other up, you're a monster. But just fuse Lilim when you get the chance and that issue won't come up again due to her reflecting most ailments. Otherwise, I don't know, good luck. Might as well try your hand at Blackjack instead. Well, that's actually in this game. Alright, I believe that's basically all the major gameplay systems out of the way. Of course there's all the different weapon types, the guns, which this is actually the only Persona game outside of P5 to have guns as their own distinct weapon type, and all that other stuff is basically just standard RPG equipment. Oh, and if Naoya dies in battle, the fight doesn't immediately end. THANK THE LORD! Back to the campaign then. Once you leave the hospital, a couple of questions arise, such as what happened to Maki, why do we have these powers, and why the heck is the enemy encounter rate on the map screen so high? Like, people often complain about the frequency of random encounters in this game, and it almost never bothers me, because it's rarely that bad. But for some reason, the map screen can range from having a battle every screen length to having one every two steps. You won't be on these screens incredibly often, but it's kinda dumb. Anywho, we briefly meet Maki's mom who's just kind of playing dead after getting shot. Philemon shows up as a butterfly, goes off about destiny and willpower and choices and all other buzzwords. And then we proceed to hear about how some company called Sebek is potentially the cause of all this. We now skid over to the school, meet up with Ayase, and then Maki shows up. She's a lot healthier and, for that matter, doesn't even seem to remember being hospitalized for six months. It's honestly a pretty good way to kick off one of the central mysteries of this game, but who gives a crap about that? Mark went to the police station to grab some guns, but he's instead been captured by some spooky goblin folk. Good job protecting him, Nanja. We then head over to the police station with Maki, have a short but neat dungeon trip, and then at the bottom we find Mark with this loon. Want me to join along with you guys? You don't have any real star power without me, so how about no! it? Next up, we find Ayase, like the legend she is, hiding behind a barrel. We recruit her without hesitance. This is a good time to note one aspect that I both love and find a bit frustrating with P1. Despite its linearity, one aspect that is pretty open-ended is the choice of your fifth party member. The game doesn't make it super clear at first, but whomever you choose to have tag along in your fifth slot, that's who's with you for the rest of the game. Giving us this choice of which party member to bring along is honestly a really cool idea and it gives each playthrough something refreshing to look forward to. It's fun seeing their different perspectives and the unique ways in which they involve themselves in the plot. 
and Ayase, being my pick, never felt too tacked on or completely irrelevant. She honestly had close to as much relevance in my experience as most of the crew. However, the level of commitment this decision throws at us is a bit odd as we're given little to no experience with anyone we're asked to recruit. So when the first option you throw at us is this dude, it's a bit of a wet blanket over an awesome concept. People often suggest for you to choose Reiji, as his character is pretty rad and he's one of the strongest units in the game anyhow. But for starters, why would I choose anyone other than Peak? And second, the open-ended nature really hits you when you look up how relatively convoluted it is to actually unlock this man. This is also unfortunate because if you fail one of these steps and think you're ready to unlock Reiji by the time you're supposed to, well then you're forced to have Ayase in your party. Here, Personi! Never mind, no complaints here of course. There are also a few story decisions that have impacts which are entirely unclear in the moment, but they can range from determining how many ultimate personas you're allowed to fuse, or more importantly, determining if the game will abruptly end three dungeons early so you'll have to restart the game in order to get the good ending. You love to see it. There's no shame in looking up a basic route guide for this game, as being sure to avoid pitfalls like this will simply save you time and is just all around a better way to be sure you're doing what you want. So time for another dungeon. You go down the abandoned factory on the hunt for the heads of Sebek. You go down the abandoned factory on the hunt for the heads of Sebek. You open a few doors and oh, Igor is just kind of here. It's interesting to see in hindsight, but Igor was apparently a mascot of this game with literally zero fanfare. Move forward to the later games and they give a lot more attention to him, to the point that he even plays a major part in the story of Persona 5. But in P1, he's just here, sitting. He's got a fancy group of musicians vibing out here too, so that's neat. But by Persona 3, they quit due to Igor's frivolous business practices. We've also got this fairy named Trish who just chills out on a rock and begs for money so she can heal you. If you say no, she calls you slurs and kicks you out. Your life is nothing. You serve zero purpose. You should- And then there's this frog kid. I honestly have no real explanation for him. He's just, he's here. They just call him the clerk, but I'm just concerned as to why he's here. Where are your parents? At the bottom of the factory, we finally encounter the game's leading antagonist for potentially the first time. This is Takahisa Kandori, a corporate dude who, actually that's about all we know about him right here. This presents our first true boss fight against his guards, and dang, it's about time I finally discussed how much I love this soundtrack. This is one of the most contentious points among why people prefer one version of this game over the other. Though in my opinion, both soundtracks are pretty close in quality. It can be more than apparent in a lot of situations that the PSP soundtrack is a bit more limited, as certain songs just don't fit the particular atmosphere of certain scenes. But holy crap, Lone Prayer and Bloody Destiny, the normal and boss themes of this game, are both absolutely unforgettable to me. This entire soundtrack is just blessed with a handful of songs that are endlessly looping in my head. Now that's something I can agree with. No matter which version, the Persona 1 soundtrack is very solid. But everyone has their favorite child, and mine just so happens to be the PS1 OST. Let's go! This is mostly because I enjoy the overall compositions here more than I do the PSP soundtrack. While there are some tracks that were remixed for the PSP remaster, there's no official way to listen to the tracks from the PS1 version. This is a damn shame because I really enjoy the dungeon themes for the Karma Palace, Police Station, and the PS1 mix of Deva Yuga. And there's also the fact that like, half the character themes are missing in the PSP port. A really cool detail about the PS1 OST is that the battle themes are dynamic. For the regular encounter theme, the song will play the last notes as the encounter ends. Sometimes this can be a bit janky, but it's still cool regardless. But my favorite use of the dynamic soundtrack is for the boss theme, Deadline. When a boss battle first starts, you'll get this ominous piece of music, but the moment you hit fight, the music gets replaced by one of the greatest guitar riffs in gaming. What Persona 1's PS1 soundtrack does best is set the tone and mood. Whether that be eerie, somber, humorous, or urgent, there's a song in this OST that'll get the job done. Which is why Ozzy's a dumb stupid dumb idiot for liking the PSP OST more. I'm only kidding, of course. Dreaming of Butterflies is generally a great opening song, and there are many tracks that I also like from the OST, but it doesn't compare to how good I think the PS1 OST is. Well put for a dude who had moron with dumb wrong opinions. Once we confront Kandori properly, we find a massive machine he refers to as the Deva system, which a rebelling scientist then pushes him into to stop him. 
You're given the choice to try and stop the system in order to spare the two. Regardless, everything goes all wonky, a little girl in black appears, and the crew wakes up back in the school. However, everything is different now in small, better ways? Also, our teacher, for some reason, seems to be stuck with a case of seasonal depression. It's probably nothing. This is where the game truly starts, and honestly, once I hit this point, I found myself fully invested in the mysteries of the plot. The girl in black is apparently terrorizing this seeming alternate universe we've stumbled into, so we have to rush out of the school to see what's up. The demon designs in this game are <laughs> absolutely memorable. That's the best way to put it. I don't think there's been another RPG to have me perpetually cackling at its opponents, from Ghost Michael Jordan to Dancing Fox Boyos to Ratbot. I adore the enemy design in this game, even if the actual quality ranges drastically. Anywho, we get to confront this little girl who definitely doesn't look like Maki no Sari. What's her name again? Aki? Yeah, checks out. The group tells her to relax and not be hostile, which she then counters by calling Mark a monkey- Wait, wait, no, no, no. I have to check something. Oh, thank goodness. Update, nope, he's still called a monkey, just in a different scene. That's, um, that, that's, um, yeah, on the note of very distinct differences between Revelation's Persona and its PSP counterpart. Oh my lord, don't even get me started. Persona 1 came out around the time when American translations of Japanese media would be heavily changed and censored. Persona 1 was no exception to this. In an attempt to Americanize Persona, many aspects of the game were altered. All references to Japan and Japanese culture were removed, alongside changing the names of the personas and spells. While we could go on for all day about the smaller changes and how they could potentially affect the gameplay, there's a very specific aspect of this version that we want to focus on. Because Revelation's persona no longer takes place in Japan, there were changes that just had to be made to the characters and dialogue in order to fit with the setting. Almost every character not only received a name change, but there were alterations made to their character designs. Our good old pal Masao Inaba is the most infamous example of this. His nickname Mark didn't need to be changed at all, but instead, the developers doubled down on changing his character design. But something that I always found strange was the fact that other characters received barely any changes to them. Like, let's take Nanjo for example. Oh, I'm sorry, I mean Nate Trinity. His general design is the same, but for some reason, they decided to change his hair color from black to red, while at the same time lightening up his skin. It's such an odd choice to alter the artwork like this. I mean, did they really think kids wouldn't understand that Asian people exist? The absolute worst redesign has to go to the protagonist. His normal design isn't anything super unique, but it's very pleasing to look at, and all of the artwork featuring him is very stylish. His Revelations design, on the other hand, looks absolutely atrocious. It's the hair that makes me think this. I find it super unpleasant to look at, and for some reason, they felt the need to remove his earring. What are we supposed to call him now that he doesn't have his earring? Looking at all the changes is like staring into an alternate reality, where everything is sort of similar, but at the same time, it's completely different and off-putting. And that's not even going into the actual quality of the translation, which, if I were to look at it objectively, gets the job done, but it's still a far cry from what it's supposed to be. It's a sign of the times for sure, but I won't deny and say that it isn't fun to look back and laugh at. Back to this game, we beat up the rat bot and head through the subway and arrive at the mall. Now, this is where you can finally purchase a wide assortment of armor and gear, or if you're me, it just means you're gambling away all your money live on stream. We head out and go through the subway, this time ending up on the wrong side of town, and one step into a mustier mall, and you're trapped there for life. Well, can't leave, so... so we we learn this place is ruled by the Harem Queen, some dork who has apparently been trapping people in this mall for a few months. Traveling down into the depths of her palace, we get a banging tune, but also have no escape from that tune, since if you thought the mall upstairs had you trapped, this dungeon is one of this game's major examples of where the heck do I go, holy crap, I'm losing my mind. Once you actually learn the path, you can walk through it in about 10 minutes, probably less. But if you don't, crank that timer up to at least an hour or more. After having a mental breakdown and only being spared by the occasional H.R. Giger portraits on the walls, we reach the Harem Queen, who is actually one of Maki's old friends, Shisato. But she's got some acne she really needs to work out. Shisato makes it clear that she has some serious grudges and jealousy towards Maki. She always felt that, despite her talents, Maki's own excellence always left her insecure, even to the point of convincing herself that she only got with her boyfriend because she knew he loved Maki. 
Those paintings we've been seeing? All hers. And according to her, we didn't appreciate them enough the first time. So she sends us back to the top to do the dungeon again. Okay, in all seriousness, this moment genuinely made me laugh from a narrative standpoint. And considering I actually knew how to navigate the dungeon this time, after staring at the map for a solid minute or two, we make it back down to Chisato in no time. She now has an even worse array of moles on her face, presumably a result of her own insecurities manifesting themselves. We learn that Aki, the little racist demon girl, actually gave Chisato a magic mirror to grant whatever wishes she desires. With that, she turns Mark to stone so he can never dance again. We're then shown one of Maki's own paintings and are asked to tell Chisato whose painting was better, hers or Maki's. Listen, Chisato, you're cool and all, and your paintings are to die for, but me and Maki have kind of got a story thing going on, so I'm just gonna lie to your face and say she's better. Cool? Cool. It wasn't cool. She then tries to beat the ever-loving crap out of us, but we stomp her because this game has very few legitimately difficult boss fights. Once we beat her, Aki says that Chisato's moles will stay in her face forever. Chisato, now with nothing to lose, finally apologizes to Maki, letting out her true emotions to her friend. This display of earnest feelings, coming to terms with her own jealousy and spitefulness when all surface interactions had made Maki believe that everything had always been alright between them. It's one of those dramatic moments that actually speaks to something real. Maki forgives her, even if Chisato can't forgive herself, but her boyfriend, Yosuke, comes in to reassure her that he loves her regardless of anything. This was actually the first moment in the game that struck a strong emotional chord for me. As I said before, Persona 1's pacing and presentation can sometimes devalue the true weight of its narrative, but moments like these where we just take a moment to let the characters unleash all their worries and troubles? It makes it evident that this core appeal for the series has been there from the very start. The way it covers these interpersonal bonds and internal conflicts is fantastic, and only got better as the series progressed. I absolutely adore this stuff. Anywho, I fought a dancing fox right after this. Wow, that's some crazy tonal whiplash from you just now. What can I say? It's Persona! Chisato's moles disappear and the plot takes us to the Lost Forest, where at the end of a small maze is a girl in a gingerbread house who absolutely definitely isn't Maki, but rather a small girl named Mai. We piece together that she is the good half to Aki's bad half. In psychology, you could refer to these two as the superego and the it of one's mind, which plays into the themes of the series in a direct yet effective way. Without getting ahead of ourselves on that note though, she then shows how terrified she is of Aki and the state of her world, feeling as though she should hide away forever. Now, I'm not saying it's insanely difficult to answer these questions right, but if you get a single question wrong in the random quiz presented, not only will the game end on a complete anti-climax two dungeons early several hours from now, but you also get punished by fighting another boss anyhow, so yeah, just look up a guide, it's dumb. We convince Mai not to hide away and she gives us her compact, or basically a locket. This leads us to finally confronting Kandori, the main antagonist who we've met… once? Simple dungeon, just run through it, do your normal thing, and there we find the man on a throne, Aki by his side. He quickly takes the compact Mai gave us, and when we question why he even needs it, well... Oh no... Yeah, you think Persona 4 serial killer is menacing? Dude just vaporized the city so he could give himself a cooler house. No competition. The compact supposedly gave him the ability to quite literally turn his dreams into reality, and his dream is apparently to be rid of all humanity and to become a god. And to that he just kinda eats out of there, back to our reality where he just killed hundreds. In an attempt to find our way back to reality, we find Maki's mom who for some reason has the appearance of a demon until we chat with her. She helps transport us right to Kandori's new hub, Deva Yuga, and we ready ourselves for the final confrontation. His dungeon is massive and complex, though far from unbearable for the most part. There's some weird nonsense with switches, but otherwise totally manageable. Just keep track of where you are and it's a cinch. Bada bing bada boom, you reach Kandori in the core of the temple, who is now seemingly… dejected. He promises he won't cause any further damage, and the crew questions what's up with him. It becomes increasingly clear, now that he's reached godhood, he's lost his purpose in life. He was granted so much power in an attempt to wipe out humanity that now nothing is out of reach, and he's simply empty. It's a complete twist, but it's a shift in personality and philosophy that's shockingly compelling. As much as I've dogged on Kandori, I actually really like this. 
We answer to him that we're all living to find our own purpose, leaving the man speechless. Mark holds firm to the idea that he's going to pursue his future without being held back by those who doubt him. Nanjo is truly matured, not just superficially, but actually shows a proper sense of empathy and understanding for others by now. Ayase admits her own faults of living in the moment out of fear for her future, but that she's done running. And Maki… well, we'll get to Maki. Kandori finally climbs to his feet as Nanjo chastises him, the boy claiming that he's not only subjecting humanity to his own fears in order to escape them, but furthermore that these desires of world destruction weren't even his idea to begin with, rather a product of whatever Aki spawned from. This sacrilegious act against the god infuriates Kandori, who finally preps himself for a true fight. The tension builds and we face off against this man driven to hateful despair with nothing to live for in the moment beyond the satisfaction of killing these kids. And so. We shoot him 500 times until he heals over. However, his persona, Nyarlathotep, which will become more relevant in the next game but for now just take it in stride, pulls an act of sacrifice as though it has its own conscience, where his persona seems to either merge with or consume him to create a true reflection of the god he's become. Everyone stands in awe at his horrific form and contemplates what insane power he must be wielding at this point. We then shoot him another thousand times and Kandori dies for real. With his dying breath, not only does he admit that he now feels more content than ever, but also he confirms a theory that Nanjo had been holding close to his chest and one that the game made a few attempts to hide. That the one who created this world and its catastrophes was none other than the consciousness of the hospitalized Maki. Now, while this twist had been somewhat obvious for a good while, Maki's role in this plot is still extremely interesting and is a perfect reflection of so many of the themes present. I haven't touched on her character as much as I could have, but Maki is this game's best character. Being born with a weak constitution and being left in and out of hospitals, especially as a kid and with a mother who wants nothing but to help yet is stuck in a job that keeps her perpetually distant from her daughter, the sheer loneliness that would manifest from that is crushing. Any bond she has, whether with Mark or Chisato, have to be left at a distance, because she has little faith in the world she lives in as is. But this new world. This realm was her idealized version of life, where she was finally with her friends as an ideal, happy version of herself, where she didn't have to worry about pain or school, where the police don't need to exist because there's no spider evil to begin with, and on a deeper level where she could finally be rid of humanity, those that she subconsciously felt had abandoned her, as her isolation in the hospital only made Maki's bitterness grow with time. But through her naive supernatural plight, we're left with the innocent and pure side of her locked away while the malicious id does the bidding of an even more desperate subconscious, leaving this Maki, the one that's been traveling with us, to realize that she is the ideal Maki. The Maki we have alongside us, now learning that she is nothing but a subconscious idea brought to life, runs away in a panic, pinning the blame of this whole catastrophe on herself and not wanting to hurt anyone any longer. In a nearby room, we discover Maki, the true Maki, unconscious in her hospital bed as she desperately dreams of a better world. And with that, we retreat back into her dreams, the team agreeing to save their friend, no matter what it takes. Even if she isn't real, she still deserves happiness. Heading back to the Lost Forest, we reconvene with the young girl Mai, who tells us that the Maki we've been following has fled even deeper into the sacred forest of protection, a literal manifestation of her own defensive mechanisms. Once we find her, Maki is just sitting there, but with her face shielded off, literally unable to show her face. But as we talk some sense into her, the same way we did with Mai earlier, she comes to her senses and gains the willpower to fight against the dark desires of her true self. This gives us the first moment in the series where a character has to confront their true self amidst a flood of different selves inside of them. And well, that's kind of what Persona is all about, isn't it? The true Maki is compared to the tale of Pandora's box, where her wishes, through some stroke of godly misfortune, unleashed a wave of chaos that destroyed everything around her by her own design. The Pandora Maki is our true final challenge, so to prepare ourselves, we enter a cavern connected to the literal sea of everyone's souls to confront the real Maki. As a side note, as someone whose favorite subject growing up has always been psychology, I love whenever Persona takes terminology from Psych and manifests it into something tangible. Not every game in the series does this to the same extent, but Persona 1 takes strides to make its influences known. By the way, this dungeon is sheer bullcrap. You only have yourself and Maki in your party, meaning some enemy combinations will likely annihilate you and either put you in another moronic charm loop 
or they'll just wipe you off the face of the planet. But the payoff is amazing as you find yourself sitting at an arcade machine playing the Atlas game Groove on Fight. He speaks to us and notes how there are thousands of selves within us, made up of our various deeds and decisions among other things, and due to our selfless behavior, actually gives us the items required to fuse our party's ultimate personas. We weren't actually high enough level to fuse them, but that's besides the point. Still, this is genuinely a clever take on the concept of confronting your true self, something which, like I stated before, is pretty core to this franchise in every game going forward. And I was pleasantly surprised with how they handled it here. It's surreal for sure, but the image of entering the room to see yourself calling out who you are to your face, as though that kid isn't just our character, but a manifestation of us, the player? It makes you sit and think for a moment. It's a really cool scene. Nevertheless, once we reach the Sea of Souls, we tell the real Maki to abandon her nihilist stance on the world. She remains dejected and apologetic, but she grants her ideal self the final compact needed to face Pandora, giving us the opportunity to have Maki truly change her outlook on life. Her ideal self is quite literally on the path to fight her inner demons. We return to our friends, prepare ourselves, and now, the final dungeon. It's a lengthy path, but we can feel the aura that this truly is Champion's Road. It's the final path to our success, and absolutely nothing will stop us. Deep into the depths of the school where her final hellscape lies, we finally reach Pandora. Ugh, I hate it, I hate it, please leave! This fight, like most in the game, is pretty simple and easy, despite the climactic nature of it all. We once again shoot a boss repeatedly until they die, and ooh, a butterfly. We then turn around and grind for several hours because heaven forbid your game has no true difficulty spikes until the final boss. In all seriousness, it's an insanely tough encounter, and it took a lot of effort to overcome. The fight to save both the world, but more importantly, Maki's self-confidence, is insanely arduous, but eventually, got him! Pandora is dumbfounded as to how we managed to stay upright through everything thrown at us, and in line with the themes of this series, the answer is friendship. I thought it was your hours and hours of grinding that helped you win. Shh. Friendship, baby. With all of this said and done, Pandora vanishes and the ideal Maki makes it clear that she too will be vanishing soon. It's a genuinely bittersweet moment, and everyone gives their goodbyes, with this Maki giving Naoya a smooch on the cheek for good measure. I did already promise Ayase that I'd marry her earlier in the game, but this Maki is about to get deleted so I'll let it slide. Philemon congratulates us, showing us his face because why not, and then he turns into a million butterflies and floats away. Okay. We get a final epilogue of each character's motivations moving forward, and even see that the real Maki is finally out of the hospital with a new outlook. According to the epilogue, the bulk of the world seemed to have disregarded this isolated apocalypse like weeks later, which... guys? GUYS! Maki returns to class, looks at all the friends she has, and looks out toward her brighter future, ending the game on a truly optimistic note. Naoya's future is for you to decide. Wait, what's that supposed to mean? Oh, and the credits ended on a typo. That's just... perfect. So, now that I've finished Persona 1, it's time I gave my final thoughts about the- Snow Queen quest. Huh? What? You know the Snow Queen quest, the second half of the game that wasn't in the American version? What- what the heck is a Snow Queen quest? Yeah, so apparently Persona 1 is special because it actually branches off into two separate storylines early in the game. While the Sebek route is what you'd consider the main plot, the Snow Queen quest is sort of an interesting what-if diversion from that whole deal. Funnily enough, the western release of Revelations Persona actually didn't feature this plot as an option, though the PSP version restored it for us to finally experience. So what the heck even is it? Luckily, this one won't take nearly as long to give an overview for, so let's rewind to about here. So, remember when I said that wandering around in the overworld feels almost unnecessary? Well, that's because you kinda have to in order to access this plotline. And let me tell ya, whoever the maniac was that realized they should run up and down the stairs of the school in order to talk to every NPC multiple times without accidentally flagging the Sebek plot just so they could unlock this innocuous B-plot, What's wrong with you? 
While unlocking the Snoking quest can be pretty obtuse, it honestly reminds me a lot of old playground rumors you'd hear when you were younger. You know, stuff like Mew being hidden under the truck in Pokemon, or really anything that requires you to fulfill some arbitrary requirement for a secret. Obviously, most of these were fake, but the Snow Queen quest is very in line with those rumors. Persona 1 came up before the internet was a household mainstay, so I can imagine it must have been really cool to discover this hidden part of the experience because a friend told you about it. And nowadays, you can just look up everything you need to know about a game online. And while that is convenient, the mystery and magic surrounding the Snow Queen quest has been lost because of it. Either that, or they just made it this way to sell more guidebooks. Whatever floats your boat. To sum up the process, we talk to this weirdo who randomly mentions how the school has a cursed stage play or something, which then makes us run all across this to talk to the student council president, the principal, the vice principal, the drama club, some janitor or something, I don't know, and one of our teachers who was completely irrelevant during the prior arc. We learned there's been some curse with a play about the Snow Queen where something something dead students don't open this box, whatever. We then find and open a box. Once walking back, our teacher, Miss Sayako, confronts us, she sees the mask, and yeah, uh-huh, yep, yeah, yeah, that's, that's about what I expected. Our quest now becomes to unfreeze the school and save our teacher, who, in an act of pure genius, has now made herself possessed by that mask that everyone already knew was possessed. But you know what? Whatever. Let's just get this over with and find some mirror shards. Yes, mirror shards. We're given this magic mirror that we need to fix in order to make Miss Sayako see her reflection or something, and we can only fix it by finding the shards hidden in three towers that have suddenly appeared. These are the Hypnos Tower, the Nemesis Tower, and the Thanatos Tower, all of which we can tackle in whatever order we want, though it makes it clear which ones are best to tackle first. <laughs> there should be no sweat though. I've already beaten this game once. How bad could it- ah! I don't want to play anymore. Ozzy, you have to. It's scary. I'm not doing it. Don't make me drag you back in there. You wouldn't dare. Ah! Haha, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back to play through the Snow Queen quest. Isn't that great? Don't you agree, Nam? Talk about the tower, stick man. So, as a brief rundown before then, the party you sticking along for this ride consists of Yukino and Ayase as required teammates. Well, we then get a choice of two extras to join us, between Nanjo, Eriko, and Brown. Want me to- yeah! All you need to know is that Yukino really cares for the teacher, and Ayase rejected this guy and called him Butterball, so now he's Worm. But we beat him up and head off to... This one is pretty simple, though let me give a quick rundown of how each tower works. You see, you make a dungeon and give it a time limit. That's it, that's, that, that's the gimmick. If you stay there too long, you have to restart the tower. In actuality, I do like the urgency that this brings. And I also like the open-endedness that comes with the dungeon designs, as two of the towers include sub-areas that add depth to both the exploration and the lore. But as is, it's a pretty standard dungeon system. With that said, Hypnos Tower quickly makes its whole deal known as we find some people from the school conked out in the dungeon. So all we do is enter the world of their dreams, pinch their dream selves to wake them up from their slumber, and then they just happen to have mirror shards after that. We also find this one girl who... Um... So this is Kumi, who we learn is one of the victims of the Snow Queen curse many years ago. And what's essentially her ghost is the ruler of this tower. Though, okay, I need to bring up something weird about this character, so apologies for this tangent. As we talk to her, we're given this glimpse into Kumi's backstory, where we're given this direct look at her life during the time when she was preparing to play the Snow Queen. That includes three major scenes, the first one being one where her clubmates seem to endlessly berate her because her parents' high expectations are pressuring the girl into putting less time into the club, which they find insulting as she already has high grades. This is then followed by her caving in and following their advice, and then once again being berated by her father, who guilt trips and chastises her for not getting near perfect grades due to her splitting her focus between the drama club and work. These are both pressures resulting from pretty minimal issues in the grand scheme of things. But pressure like this is, well, it's extremely real. Kumi isn't shown to really talk back to anyone here and only tries to nervously rationalize things with them. But all she's met with is hostility. There's no sympathy to be given to her. So her last flashback shows the girl in bed wishing that reality was as kind to her as her ideal dream reality. Just a simple wish that she could escape into her fantasies, even for a moment, from that level of stress. This is something that the Snow Queen takes advantage of and literally forms a dream world of escapism for Kumi after killing her. In that moment of wishing, she had no clue that this would literally happen, 
but her own emotional weakness from those stresses brings her to this point. Now, why am I going so in-depth about this? Well, it's because the party you're playing as then proceeds to directly mock her for even thinking that her problems were more than trivial. And this is not a defense of escapism or anything. There are future arcs, even in Persona itself, that cover very similar subject matter to this, but instead of displaying any level of sympathy along with their disagreements, Kumi is simply met with condescension and pity for her foolishness, where characters call her weak and selfish for... what? Not taking the bullying in stride? And our team isn't called out for this in the future. Based on how the later towers go, the implication is that your team is fully in the right to do this. And it just rubs me the wrong way. I don't know, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but the message on display here feels kind of gross to me in execution. So we fight Kumi to free her of her dream world, and they try and spin the earlier moments as Kumi needing to have dreams but not fully escaping into them, and that she needs to instead strive to actually do something in person, but it just rings really hollow. There was no implication that she wasn't trying. In fact, they made it seem like she really was- Ugh, gosh, whatever. Tower defeated, moving on. We then go to the Nemesis Tower, which is written with much less moral grayness and is way more lighthearted. Um, ignore the students being tortured over here. Wait, is, is she waterboarding him with milk? And he's lactose intolerant! Oh my gosh, that's so brilliantly evil! This tower is ruled by Michiko, another Snow Queen victim, and her character trait is that she is a bad person and there really isn't much else to it. She is just shallow and superficial, which, considering the last tower, is really jarring. But I'll at least say that I enjoyed this tower more. I mentioned the torture before, but there's actually a fun gameplay quirk that comes from it, where we piss her off so much that she turns off the tower timer and she allows us to either ignore our friends and search the tower for the mirror shard we need to beat the game, or we can take a left, immediately save our friends, and fight her instantly. Though according to her, we won't get the mirror shard if we do. This is honestly clever, and I find it really fun. Plus, choosing to go left actually gives you an extra shard anyhow. So we go in, kick her teeth in, and we're already out of there. So last but not least, least is, it's the Hypnos Tower. It's the freaking Hypnos Tower. We're now in the Thanatos Tower, and I think the gimmick here is insanely cool. So the girl who runs it, Yuriko, just exudes cocky charisma and wants everything to be up to chance. And from that chance, the first option she gives you determines who has their persona stolen. Yeah, so in our dungeon, we have to have one or more party members barred from using persona skills. And if we want to retrieve any of their personas, we quite literally have to enter the underworld to rescue them like we're in the plot of Hercules or something. The underworld is also called Tartarus here, so yeah, we'll be back in this hellhole soon. Regarding the mirror shards, we can find some scattered around Tartarus, but more interesting is how Yuriko just gives us a 50-50 shot at getting an extra one. Is it messed up? Maybe. Is it funny? Absolutely. Plus, I'm pretty sure you can still get the good ending without it, so I'm not going to tell you which one is the correct one. Good luck, sucker. Confronting Yuriko, she attempts to appeal to the vanity of our party, but it doesn't work at all, so we just beat her up like the rest. And after beating her, she goes off explaining her backstory, and I actually find the philosophy here really interesting. She describes the period of time around her death akin to the others, except she talks about how endlessly happy she was. She had great friends, a loving family, was starring as the head of a play, got good grades, everything was perfect. But as she thought about it, a spark of anxiety hit her. If this is potentially the peak of her life, where she couldn't possibly be happier, then it means that everything going forward has to be downhill, right? The anxiety snowballed until she had begun to close herself off from everyone growing more terrified at the thought of losing her perfect life, even though that exact stress was causing her to do just that. And now she could see it all actively slipping away, until the Snow Queen spoke to her, and said that there was a way to maintain her beauty and joy forever, eternally perfect in the embrace of death. It's not perfectly written by any means, but I find the idea it poses really intriguing. And it's interesting as she's the only one who doesn't need convincing that she's wrong. She fully confronts it after your fight without any nudging from the party, and regrets what happened, and all she wants is to wish you all well. And, well, it's a small touch, but it's appreciated. And mirror complete! Let's see what the fruits of our labor grant is. Oh, that- who even is that? What is- oh, oh, we're, we're straight up fighting the mask now, huh? So we employ the usual strategy of shoot thing until it dies. 
and Miss Sayako is alright. She tells us that the random woman who showed up is her childhood friend, the final Snow Queen victim. And now we have to chase her down to fix the school. So, one last dungeon. How bad could it be? Uh, you okay, man? It's just one dungeon. There's no way it could be that bad. If ever in my life I have to play through this endless labyrinth of stairs again, I'll freeze the school myself. Sounds like maybe you should cool off? I am going to beat you to death. Before entering the final dungeon, it's revealed that the Snow Queen is actually the spirit of Miss Saiko's childhood friend named Tomomi. Back when the two of them were in high school, they were competing for the lead role in the Snow Queen play. Unbeknownst to Tomomi, however, Saiko ended up backing down from the role because she was afraid of the curse surrounding it. Tomomi became disfigured upon putting on the mask, and ended up passing away shortly after, with her spirit residing within the mask itself. So when Miss Saiko put on the mask at the start of the story, Tomomi's spirit took control. And that brings us to where we are now. When the group used the demon mirror against Tomomi's spirit, she saw what she had become. Because of this self-awareness, her persona separated from her body and took the form of an entity calling itself the Night Queen. She plans to bring about Eternal Night, which will in turn freeze over the world. The Night Queen retreats to her ice castle, and it's now up to the group to ascend the tower and face off against the deity to put a stop to her plans. Also, Maki and Kanduri are here, for some reason. That's all I've got to say about that. The final fight is pretty simple, where depending on the attacks they've used, it changes their weakness. So of course we mindlessly shoot the boss one last time and put the Night Queen into an eternal slumber. That's right, I killed her. Once defeating the Night Queen, the school thaws out, Maki and Kandori zip out of there, and the plot just picks up right where we branched into this route. Like, like the end of the story is just your team leaving to play through the Sebek route. I, what was gained? What was accomplished? Why, why did I play this? Okay, okay, now that I'm actually done with Persona 1, time for some final thoughts. Persona 1 is a game that I expected to be somewhat passive toward. Don't get me wrong, it's probably overall the most flawed and least memorable experience within the series by a decent margin, but despite all that, it has so many elements that I absolutely adore, and it introduced so many stable elements in terms of writing and mechanics that paved the way for some of my favorite aspects of the future games. Simultaneously though, it has a lot of design and writing decisions that make it a bit of a tough sell at times, and there are long stretches where that Persona magic takes a backseat to a loop of repetitive gameplay and poorly presented storytelling. While Sebek's route is a slower experience, the plot itself has a much stronger presence and tended to compel me far more. While Snow Queen was shorter and had a significantly more interesting gameplay loop, but oh my gosh, I was really grasping for any solid plot moment to cling on to, and most didn't land for me at all. Persona 1 can be incredibly janky and flawed. It's a capsule of a lot of early experimental JRPG pitfalls and writing tropes, yet it succeeds in spite of that. It seems to have captured this bolt of quality that the developers ran with, even if they didn't know exactly the best way to utilize it. And they used that ambitious sprint to give the series a running start, eventually leading us to what is now Atlas's most popular series within the public eye. It's an oddly flawed yet magical blueprint for the future. As its own experience, it's sufficiently satisfying, if not in dire need of another remake, in my opinion. But in terms of what it represents and the ambition it brought to the table, I can't help but love it. It's so uniquely Persona. But if you want my honest recommendation, just read the dang manga. Not to shift this into an entire review of this manga, though if you want that, then maybe I can make a dedicated video for patrons or something. Seriously, let me know if you'd be interested in that. But it's probably one of the best pieces of extended media this series has ever received. Megami Ibunroku Persona, written by the legend Shinto Ueda, is a phenomenal adaptation taking liberties in storytelling where she feels necessary to tell a truly gripping story of memorable characters and heavy plot beats. In terms of storytelling, it takes the outline left behind by the game and fills in the details in a way that any fan of the series should absolutely check out. And the art only accentuates things to grant it its own gorgeous style. It doesn't have an official translation into English, but if you can find a fan scanlation online, you owe yourself to read it. With all that said though, I'll let Nam give the last of his thoughts on the game itself. 
For me personally, I think Persona 1 is just okay. There are some really solid ideas here, and the premise is certainly unique, but I think that there are too many flaws in the execution here that keep the game from reaching its full potential, especially when looking at the mechanical side of things. Though, putting my opinion aside, it's hard to deny how influential this game is on the rest of the series. Persona 1 provided the series with a solid foundation that would be tweaked and refined with every entry in the series, which shows how strong the identity of this game actually is. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure if I can fully recommend this game to the average player. I personally don't regret playing through it, but that's mostly because I was curious about it. You should at least check it out to see if it's up your alley. So, as I'm going to be reviewing each Persona game going forward, I feel it's only appropriate to start ordering them in terms of my personal seal quality. So, stealing the first place spot, here is our reigning champion, Persona 1. First place out of one. What a surprise. Truly an accomplishment of quality. But Ozzy, how can you rank this game if it doesn't exist? Woo! I already made this joke. Get out. But the video- GET OUT OF MY HOUSE! One down, several games to go. Thanks a ton for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit the like button, subscribe, share, and do whatever it is the kids do these days. Am I allowed back inside? Ugh, fine, fine. In all seriousness, big thanks to Nam for teaming up with me for this video. He makes some awesome videos, including his own review of this game. So if you wanted more of his thoughts on this game and various other things, links to his stuff are down below and in the upper corner. Thanks for having me on! As Ozzy said, I make video game reviews of my own, mainly focusing on Persona along with the rest of the Mega Ten series, with a few curveballs thrown in here and there. If that at all sounds interesting to you, please consider checking out my channel, Nom's Compendium. But be warned, they can get pretty long. With my future Persona reviews, I'll make sure to keep kidnapping some familiar faces within the community. So I hope you're all looking forward to that. I've got a ton planned, so bear with me. Special thanks to all my patrons, all of which are listed here, and more shoutouts to all supporters and friends who continue to push me to make this stuff. It's always a blast to make these videos, and you guys help so much. Also, for anyone who's actively followed the behind the scenes of me making this video, that whole outro I just read off was written over a year ago, and I'm in shock that I actually got the video out. Yeah, this was meant to release in February of 2021. That, uh didn't happen. But I'm striving to make this my best year yet, even if we're kicking off a bit late into the year. But sincerely, I mean it. Thank you so much for watching. With that said, stay safe, dream of butterflies, and please draw more art of this cast, I'm begging you!